Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew, the 17th chapter. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. He was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son. The beloved, with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace, mercy, and yours, uh, grace, mercy, and peace are yours from the Triune God. Amen. Matthew's Gospel account of Jesus' transfiguration has a particular context what takes place beforehand, what takes place afterwards. It's good for us this morning, I think, to get a picture of the entire setting because the gospel begins with the words six days later, and that naturally begs the question, six days after what? Well, it was six days after Jesus asked his disciples in Caesarea Philippi, who do you say that I am? That means it was six days after Peter answered him, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. It was six days after Jesus first told them he was going to be arrested, crucified, raised from the dead. So it's six days after he put, he, he rebuked Peter for putting down the uh, crucifixion. It was six days after he taught about the importance of self-denial and of following in the way of the cross. And finally, it was six days after he promised that some of you standing here will not taste death until you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. As if on cue then, in today's reading, Jesus takes Peter and James and John up to the top of a mountain, up to Neverland, <laughs> where he is visibly made brilliant and glistering like the sun. At this event, the disciples see and say and hear and feel. They see Christ transfigured. He's speaking together with Moses and Elijah. They see too the bright glory cloud overshadowing them all. They say, at least Peter says, it is good to be here. It's good for us to be here. And from the cloud they hear a voice, this is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. The same heavenly declaration that was made at Jesus' baptism. Especially the disciples hear a strong command, listen to him. And then in their terror and collapse, they definitely feel the gentle and loving touch of Jesus as he reassures them to get up and not be afraid. Down the mountain they return. In the valley below, they get caught up in a situation where the remaining disciples are falling short. The book of Matthew continues. When they came to the crowd, a man came to him, knelt before him and said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's an epileptic and he suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples. They could not cure him. Jesus answered, you faithless and perverse generation. How much longer must I be with you? How much longer 
must I put up with you? Bring him here to me. Is Jesus venting some serious frustration here? And to whom? To the crowd? To the disciples? The boy's father? Well, anyway, Jesus rebuked the demon. It came out of him, and the boy was cured instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why couldn't we cast it out? And he said, Because of your little faith. It goes on that they were gathering in Galilee, and Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into human hands, and they're going to kill him, and on the third day he'll be raised. And it says they were all greatly distressed. A whole lot of happenings going on in very short period of time, just a matter of days, together with a whole lot of emotions being expressed. From elation and ecstasy on the one end, all the way over to fear, unbelief, and great distress on the other. Everything spins wildly out of control for everyone, nearly everyone. And especially the disciples' hopes are dashed again and again as Jesus repeatedly warns about his coming demise. Following Jesus can be a crazy roller coaster ride of high highs and low lows and everything in between. Whirling fast, fast, fast up the mountain, down the valley, here basking in a glory cloud, there cringing in holy terror or just terror. Sometimes we're soaring high with Peter Pan, and sometimes we're shot down like Wendy Bird, pelted with sticks and stones. So how do we make sense of so many sudden experiences and sensations? How do we make sense of things that don't make sense? Like the violent, demonized condition of a child. I mean, an innocent little boy, the scripture says. I have a beautiful granddaughter. I'm going to show you a picture. This is Grandpa and Marjorie together. Marjorie is a beautiful 15-year-old, active, curly-topped, redhead. And here we are at a wedding celebration. Somebody snapped a picture of the two of us. Marjorie is special needs. From the time that she was about six years old until the present, she has suffered terrible, terrible seizures, often hundreds in a day. Drop seizures are the worst. They range, their seizures range anything from mental abness, absence, and small tremors on the one side and all the way over to grand malls. But drop seizures, they throw her down and she's been subject to head and face and teeth injuries. It's never good. Thankfully, she's mostly unaware of all of this when it happens, except that when she's injured, she knows it when she wakes up. From the beginning, she's been under the care of the world's most competent medical experts and seizure specialists, including both here in Seattle at the University of Washington and also at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Her condition has been diagnosed as Lennox-Gestalt syndrome, but not 100% because there are some things about her particular condition that remain outside the bounds of that diagnosis and continue to be a mystery. While her stability is managed as well as possible by medicines and medical equipment, her overall condition really hasn't abated. There are many unknowns. A next possible therapy could be the complete severing of the two hemispheres of her brain, but that then would also result in kind of a she would not have a quality life afterwards. I'll say it that way. But it may, it could possibly relieve the seizures. Even that's an unknown. Her parents are not willing to go this direction and uh, 
her grandparents, of course, uh, support them in all of their decisions. Parents, close family, grandparents all grieve Marjorie when she suffers, and how do you make sense of it? How, do you, how can any relief be found? We pray, we think happy thoughts, we do everything we can to discover whatever we can, and we move forward. When those whom we love are negatively affected, then we are negatively affected. Everyone around is affected. They suffer, we also suffer. You never know what in the world you're going to next encounter. Will it be elation or desperation? Will it be the world of Caesarea Philippi or the Transfiguration Mount or the valley below or over in the layover in uh, the Galilee? It doesn't much matter because everywhere and every place are unexpected highs and lows and ups and downs and all arounds. If the voice conveyed by the majestic glory tells us to listen, just as it told Peter and James and John to listen, then what is that particular message that God wants us to hear and understand, especially as we go through wild times? Can we get any clues from today's reading? When we listen for the Lord, what message can we hear? So I find three personal takeaways from the different declarations that were spoken on the mount. The voice from heaven, the voice of Peter, and the voice of Jesus. The voice from heaven. This is my beloved son, heaven's voice declares. Like I said, it's the same words given at Jesus' baptism, and they are ours as well. You are God's beloved daughter. You are God's beloved son. You're beloved. We mutually assured ourselves of this this morning as we remembered that we're joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. As also we, repeat, we repeated that above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit. Renew our lives in your forgiveness, grace, and love. Will not God, therefore, abundantly shower us whenever we thus remember and remind ourselves and ask? You're God's beloved, beloved child. God will never let you go. We need to let that truth sink down deeply into us. Truth is, no matter what we go through or whatever our family or friends have to endure, God's own relentless abiding love surrounds and sustains. Along with King David, we sing, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. The voice of Peter. It's good for us to be here, he said. His kind offer to build three tabernacles ac accurately describes his will for them to remain on the mountain for as long as possible. It's good for us to be here, so let's set up camp. Spiritual mountaintop experiences are not that frequent or common, although sometimes we may, through liturgical worship or the divine meal, be elevated to the holy mountain or find our way into a secret, sacred garden space, far removed from the all too wild world of human existence, we find respite, peace, and renewal. It's important at these times for us to let time slow down and to a standstill and to relish and cherish and simply to linger while you're on the mountaintop with God Take time to just linger in it. God's presence is, God is ever present, but seldom truly entered and enjoyed at times. Jesus selected the three disciples to witness his glory on the holy mountain, but in another place he compassionately invited all twelve. As he said, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. 
the voice of Jesus. Get up. Do not be afraid. He assures them as he comes and touches them physically. Then they accompany him down the mountain. Get up. Don't be afraid. Another way to say it. Take courage. Take courage. Move forward. Life advances toward us and upon us, whether we agree to it or not. But taking courage and renewing our faith to this, we ought to give some attention. Of course, there is encouragement to know that the one who tells us to get up and take courage and move forward is the one who leads us and walks alongside. Peter assures the Thessalonians in his earliest Christian writing, faithful is he who called you who also will do it. And Jesus never promised that the end of the world would work out for us according to our personal expectations or demands. He only promised to be present. These are the last 14 words of the Gospel of Matthew. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. It boils down to this. We have to face up to whatever life doles out. We can either do it with stress and ignorance, or else we can do it with the knowledge of the abiding, faithful, personal presence of Jesus. Whenever we do do it with such knowledge, no matter what happens, the abiding, faithful, personal presence of Jesus is always Good news. Amen. <laughs>